section seven steps to a peaceful control room how to implement an effective alarm management program for your Delta V system. My name is Todd Stauffer. I'm the director of alarm management at Exida. Um, the necessary disclaimer, and I'm joined by Kim Van Camp from Emerson. So if you uh, work with operators that experience nuisance alarms, alarm floods, or if your alarm summary display is always full or overflowing with alarms, it's hard to tell when new alarms come in. This is a presentation for you. We're going to talk about things that you can do to improve the situation in your plant, how to create an effective alarm management program, some of the key alarm management principles that you need to apply. And we want to make sure, we really want to strive for giving you all something that you can take away from this presentation that you could take back to the plant and do. We also, the other ulterior motive of this presentation is to give you an idea of some of the really powerful alarm management features in Delta V that not everybody knows about. So you can think about how you might take advantage of them or implement them in your system. So with that, let's get started and look at what the purpose of an alarm is supposed to be. Uh, in this drawing here, we can see that normally your process control system or your DCS is able, effectively able to keep the process within your green zone, your normal operating zone. There will be situations where that is not successful at doing that, where the DCS is not successful and the process will move into the abnormal situation area. That's when we want an alarm to occur. And we want that alarm to tell the operator what has happened, help them figure out what the cause, what they should do, and to be able to take the appropriate corrective action within the within the right amount of time. If that happens, then the process deviation will turn around and will go out of the abnormal region back into the normal operating region. That's what we want to have happen. However, if the operator doesn't respond, the process continues to deviate and we end up either with a consequence or a shutdown, which we want to try and avoid. So the whole idea here is for an alarm, the way it's supposed to work, when the alarm occurs, that means, Mr. Operator, you need to do something. You need to take a corrective action or else a consequence will occur. So pretty simple concept. Unfortunately, in the real world, a lot of our alarm systems are not really set up to match up with that idea of what an alarm is supposed to be. So if you have nuisance alarms or if you're overloaded with alarms, those are examples of, we'll call them villains, that will rob the alarm system performance in your plan. Um, I've heard an analogy of operators in a modern process plant uh, being kind of equivalent to an airline pilot, meaning they have a lot of data that they need to take in, they need to make quick decisions, they need to understand what's going on, and their decisions will have a significant impact on the business, safety, and people's lives. So the alarm system is one of the key tools to help the operator make those decisions. So if your alarm system has these problems, that's obviously going to impair the operator's ability to do their job. So we want to change that. Let's take a look at an example of where nuisance alarms or having some of those alarm management villains present in your plant can result in a dangerous situation. This is a pretty common design, sump pumps, where we have an automatic pump that based on the level in the uh, sump will automatically pump the water out. It's designed with a high and low level alarm that are also used to automatically turn on and turn off the pump. So the pump will turn on at the high level alarm and it will turn off at the low level alarm. So obviously then the operator is going to see a high level alarm and a low level alarm every time the pump works. So let's take a look at how that actually came into play in a real life um, scenario. This was a chemical plant where they were pumping reagent into a neutralization area and that reagent pump developed a significant leak that filled up the sump area and filled up the dike. Now, it did generate a high and high, high level alarm, but what do you think the, op the operator in this case did? They ignored the alarm because every other time that that high level alarm had occurred, all it did was indicate that the pump had turned on. 
So with that as the background from a human factors point of view, they felt that they could ignore that and they focused only on the neutralization area as where the problem might actually be, which was incorrect. So they ignored those alarms because they were used to doing that. That's what they'd always done. And unfortunately, things got worse. The dike overflowed. The next thing you know, they spilled 10,000 gallons. It wasn't noticed until somebody was doing the rounds that they had a problem. So this is an example of where that sump high level alarm um, was a nuisance alarm and because of that it caused the operator to not respond appropriately or not deal with that situation appropriately. So to address those situations that was the purpose and goal of the creation of the ISA 18.2 alarm management standard. First came out in 2009. That's the standard that really applies to facilities in the US and maybe North America. And then that standard was used as the basis for the creation of an international standard, IEC 62682. So every company, whether you're international or just based here in the US, now has a standard that they should really follow from an alarm management point of view. Now the ISA standard was actually just updated and re-released a couple of months ago with some minor changes. Both of those standards are very similar um, in terminology, requirements, and they both talk about what's called an alarm management life cycle, which is really a con concept of a workflow process for alarm management, how to create an effective alarm management program that what you can use to drive continuous improvement um, over time. Now, in addition to those standards, how many have read or had a copy, seen a copy of the ISA 18.2 standard? How many were able to read the whole thing without falling asleep once or twice? It's, it's a long document, it's not bad, but it's a, it's a tough read. One of the things that you would take away is, it tells me what I need to do, but not how to do it. It's a little short on that. Well, that's actually what a standard is supposed to be. It's not supposed to tell you how to do it. It's, it's up for, for you to decide how you will do things to meet the requirements. Now, to help people deal with the, what do we actually do here, that's where we come up with some technical reports. So as ISA put out a series of technical reports that dive into more detail on the different stages of the alarm management life cycle. So you can see that there's quite a few of them and most all of them are available now. There's also a new standard coming out on safety controls, alarms, and interlocks that will relate to how safety alarms are dealt with, both from a process safety and alarm management point of view. Now, one of the things that the standard talks about is what an alarm is supposed to be. It gives a definition. An audible and or visual means of indicating to the operator equipment malfunction, process deviation, or other abnormal condition requiring a timely response. Highlighted a couple words there because we want to make sure that an alarm represents an abnormal condition. Something has happened that we did not expect. Something is wrong. If we think about our sump pump example, that alarm, that high level alarm, does that, is that consistent with the definition? Was that an abnormal condition? No, it wasn't. That was an alarm that essentially indicated it was time for the pump to turn on. Timely response. Operator must take a corrective action, something that will um, correct the process, something that will correct the abnormal situation. So opening a valve, turning on a pump, something like that. Again, if we look at the sump pump example, was there a operator action required in that case to respond to that alarm? No, there wasn't. So you can see that that alarm did not comply with the definition. So it shouldn't have been an alarm in the first place and that was part of what led to the incident. The idea of going and looking at your alarms and comparing them to what this definition says is a process that's called alarm rationalization, which we'll talk about more in a little bit. Now one of the the problems also with alarm management is in certain cases people use the alarm system to communicate everything that the operator needs to know, whether it's an alarm or not. Where we want to get to or the goal is that every message or everything that's um, presented to the operator within the alarm summary display should follow this definition. So we want to make sure that when something shows up there, the operator doesn't need to think twice. They know that they need to respond. So what do we do with all the other notifications? Do we get rid of them? Not necessarily. They may still be of value to the operator. So what we can do is categorize them a little differently 
maybe look at does the operator need to respond? Is it an abnormal or expected situation? Create different categories for these other message types and actually display them differently in Delta V. And you can do that in Delta V. You can separate out these other types of notifications, display them outside of the alarm summary. So from then on, when an operator sees an alarm, they know I gotta respond. And they can always look for this other information on an as needed basis. So let's take that information now, put it together in how do we create an effective alarm management program. And this should work, what we have here, it's been applied at many different types of facilities. The basis should work for any facility that you all run. First step is to benchmark your initial performance. So as part of any performance improvement program, what do you need to do first? Document your starting point. So we'll talk about some of the tools that you can use to do that. Second step in this case is to create an alarm philosophy document. What's the guideline or standard for doing alarm management at your particular site? How do you prioritize alarms? Things like that. Third step is to rationalize the alarms. Go through that process of evaluating the alarms, making sure they meet the definition and other criteria. Fourth step would be to take the rationalization results and implement that in Delta V and also create alarm response procedures as part of that. We'll talk more about what that means as well. And then you may need to also at some times create some alarm suppression to perhaps suppress alarms in cases where they're not relevant. When equipment is out of service or if you get a trip after a big piece, if you get an alarm flood after a big piece of equipment trips. The final step in this continuous improvement mode here is to measure your performance on a monthly basis. So you're, you're def benchmarking, you're defining your philosophy, and then you're getting into a continuous improvement program where you're cycling back between all those steps. And then the final step, part of the program, is to audit what's happening. Audit the database, audit the processes and procedures that you're actually using to make sure you're following what you said you would. And the whole idea is to make the alarm system into a viable tool for the operator to drive performance and process safety. So let's start and we'll walk through those different stages of the alarm management improvement program. Thank you, Todd. The Emerson product used to um, analyze the history of alarms is the uh, Delta B Analyze product. Uh, using this product, you can obtain the, uh, you can create your baseline, and as well identify uh, the issues that uh, you can address to uh, eliminate a lot of the nuisance alarms. As you look at the uh, ISA um, 18.2 standard, there are a number of measurements. They're called key performance indicators or KPIs. And using Delta B Analyze, you can actually get the numbers corresponding to the benchmark recommendations in the standards to uh, establish where you're at to begin with. And I think we have a few just examples highlighted. Uh, these are not all of the uh, uh, one for ones between the standard and Delta B Analyze. But here's an example, the average alarm rate per 10 minutes, 89, that's pretty overwhelming. Uh, the uh, recommended value for uh, the number of alarms per 10 minutes would be between one and two, something in that neighborhood. And here's a couple more examples. The percentage of the time that you're in an alarm flood condition, uh, the percent contribution of the 10 alarms that occur most often. Quite often you'll find that, uh, in this case it's very typical, 70% of the alarms were coming from just uh, the first 10 alarms in terms of the ones that occur most frequently. Another uh, metric is the uh, priority distribution. Uh, this one here, uh, uh, you have uh, a situation where you have a lot of warning alarms and, and critical alarms. Um, uh, ideally you'd have uh, the uh, distribution shown on the left, they're 80% below, uh, maybe 15% uh, medium, and just 1% high. Um, if you do not have Delta V analyzed to obtain your benchmark measurements, there is an alternative solution for you, and that is to request a report from Emerson uh, to get that information. Uh, this first time report that you can obtain per system uh, does not require anything. Uh, what it does require you to do is upload uh, an event history for a month. And so given that uh, report, you can get the information you need. And then uh, following that, if you wanted to be able to create more reports in the future, uh, you could either subscribe to a service to get those alarm reports periodically, 
or you could purchase Delta V Analyze and just run the reports yourself. Uh, using those complementary reports, we uh, graphed some of the performance that we saw on systems in 2014 and 2015. What you're looking at here is a scatter diagram where each dot represents a particular system where we did an alarm analysis. And I broke it out by industry because that can be kind of interesting as well. Now, what you're seeing here on the horizontal axis is the number of alarms that come in during a 10 minute period when you're not in an alarm flood. So if you're seeing a lot of alarms coming in during those times that you're not in a flood, uh, this is somewhat a measure of the number of nuisance alarms, things like chattering, fleeting, those kind of bad actors. The vertical axis here represents the number of alarms in a 10 minute period uh, on average when you're actually in a true alarm flood. There's been something happened and there really is a disruption and how many alarms are you seeing then? Now the uh, benchmark target would be down in this left corner right here. Each dot representing for a particular system how the operator console positions are uh, performing uh, based on the data that we got. So there's some good news here and that is, is that a lot of current Delta V customers are already moving down into that zone here. Uh, some of these customers right here, they were obtaining their report from us for the sake of having an initial benchmark. They knew they had a problem, they just wanted to quantify the problem. Uh, I think a few people also were just sending in their reports to show off. That, that's what we got to that. Um, so I think at this point right here, it's back to you, Todd. Yep. Okay. So once you've identified your issues, now you're ready to launch into creating an alarm philosophy document. And the ISA standard defines the content that's supposed to be in your philosophy. Stuff like HMI design, how do you prioritize alarms, things like that. So we're gonna talk about some of these and some of the key considerations. How do you determine what should be an alarm? How do you prioritize alarms? How to do classification? Discussion about using alarm shelving, alarm suppression, and alarm response procedures. One of the things I wanted to call out, the, the four at the bottom here in gray are new additions. This is what was added in the 2016 version of the standard. And in particular, I want to call out alarm response procedures. That's a required section. Alarm response procedures, we're going to see, that's what Delta V alarm help is. So that's an important thing to think about putting into your system to enable operators to be able to help understand and respond to alarms. The other thing I want to point out is alarm shelving. That's a recommended section that needs to be in a document. We're going to talk about alarm shelving and what it is and how important it is. It's a recommended section for a philosophy document, but what we'll see later is it's actually required functionality for a DCS from now on. So it's pretty important stuff to think about how to use. So let's move on and take a look at how do we determine whether something is an alarm or not to find some criteria to put into your philosophy that you can apply over and over again in a consistent fashion that will help you weed through whether something is an alarm. Take the emotion out of it. Take the subjectivity out of it. So if this is an example of criteria that's been recommended and used and you all could use in your plants. So you would ask for a, for a given alarm that you're looking at. Does it indicate a malfunction, deviation, or abnormal condition? You can see that relates directly to the definition of an alarm that we talked about. Does it require timely operator action? Does the operator have sufficient time to respond? You get the idea. If you can't answer yes to all those questions for a given alarm, it should not be an alarm. Maybe it should be an alert, maybe you should get rid of it, but the idea is you can use that criteria to help weed out points that don't warrant being an alarm. Now you can do that during rationalization but another way to think about it is any time that somebody recommends adding an alarm to your system, before you do it, say, okay, I need you to answer these questions for me. And unless you can do that, unless you can answer yes, we're not going to implement this alarm in our system. Because one of the things that you'll find is you can implement a good program for alarm management, but additions, adding a new piece of instrumentation, stuff can sneak in that way because it don't, doesn't go through your full normal alarm management process. So you always want to make sure you're applying this criteria. Next thing you want to do in your philosophy is define how you're going to prioritize alarms. So what is alarm priority for? That's really the means for the operator to de determine which alarm is most important. 
So if they have two alarms present at the same time, which one do they respond to first? That's what priority is to indicate, supposed to indicate. So the recommended way to assess the priority of the alarm is to evaluate it based on the consequences. So what would happen if the operator didn't respond? that coupled with the amount of time that they do have to respond. And typically you create a matrix of those elements. Now, in general, it only makes sense to have three or four different process alarm priorities. If you have more than that, it gets confusing for the operator to understand which one is actually more important than another. So using the delta V defaults of critical warning advisory is not a bad start. Now what we show here in our alarm prioritization um, configuration is using the priorities between three and seven for some other purposes, maybe to allow us to, to put those non-alarm type messages in there. So alerts or prompts or messages or diagnostic alarms, some people use them for interlock alarms, for bypass alarms. The whole idea of doing it is uh, alarms of priority seven and above are typically what appears in the alarm summary display. So if you add priorities below seven, you can make it so they don't show up with the other alarms. And then you can create dedicated displays to show just those priorities. There was a good presentation at the Emerson Exchange last year about how to do that. And if you're interested, we can post that on the exchange as well when we're done. Now let's talk about managing alarms and tools that you could provide to the operator to deal with scenarios where you have alarm management issues. And to me, this is one of the major game changers when it comes to improving alarm system performance from an operational point of view. Rationalization you do to, to help the design, but once you get it in, in operational practice, then you need to deal with these kind of things. So examples that we'll look at how do you deal with when you have a transmitter connected to your DCS, it's generating alarms, but it's not commissioned yet? Do you make the operator just put up with those alarms? Do you disable the alarm? You know, what, what do you do? What's your process? Similarly, what do you do when you have a, a hardware malfunction that results in alarms? And that hardware can't be fixed immediately, so does the operator just need to suck it up and deal with those alarms? Do you disable the alarm? Does it go through an MOC process? You have to write it down in a log externally and keep track of all this stuff. How about when you're testing or calibrating? How do you deal with alarms in that case? And when equipment is out of service or not being used? How about when a piece of equipment trips and generates an alarm flood? Or how about if you just have a plain nuisance alarm? Do you make your operators <coughs> deal with that? Or do you have other techniques? Do you have ways of disabling the alarm or um, have engineers come in and, and take care of the alarm design? Um, what's, what's the way that you currently handle that? But what I want you to think about is there are ways to make that better. I would, I would be willing to bet that if you look at the capabilities that exist in Delta V version 13 for suppression, you'll find that there are better ways to handle all of those scenarios than the way you handle them today. And part of what we're talking about is capability to hide the presence of the alarm from the operator when they don't need to see it. And the ISA standard defines three different types of suppression. The first one is called design suppression. So that means behind the scenes, the control logic is configured to be smart enough to suppress alarms when the operator doesn't need to see it. Second type is called alarm shelving. This is like the snooze button for the operator. Nuisance alarm comes in, the operator realizes it's a nuisance alarm, it can't be fixed immediately, but he'd like to get it out of his field of view so it doesn't distract him. That's what alarm shelving would be for. And then maintenance is when you would take an alarm out of service for maintenance. So it's going to be suppressed for long term um, to replace the, the hardware failure or scenario like that that we talked about. Now in Delta V version 13, all three of these uh, suppression scenarios are supported. So let's talk about a little bit about how you would decide how to take advantage of them. The first one is shelving. So this is the temporary suppression of an alarm by the operator. I've talked to a lot of end users that are concerned about allowing their operators to shelve alarms, to suppress alarms. Some people don't think that's a good idea. Well, I would say if you're in that 
situation or if you feel that way, go sit in the control room when you have a chattering alarm going off every five minutes and see how easy it is for the operator to do their job. Hopefully you'll realize that there is a time and a place for allowing operators to do this shelving. Now this is a native capability of Delta V. Each has the ability to have a different suppression timeout defined. So you can define how long the alarm could be shelved, whether it could be zero, which means it's not suppressible or one shift or whatever. But the idea is you can think about under what circumstances can operators shelve alarms. Maybe only for the warning and advisory alarms, but maybe not critical priority alarms. So the idea is this is really important and powerful capability. And again, as I said, this was added as a mandatory requirement of all DCS suppliers from now on. So this is such an important capability to provide to the operators that the DCS has to have this functionality. So I think it's a good idea for you all to figure out how you would take advantage of it, because somebody thinks it's pretty important. So these are some things to think about. Now, in Delta V version 13, you can also differentiate the operator suppressing the alarm, we call that shelving, versus maintenance removing the alarm from service. You can do that from a faceplate or other places within the system, and the idea is you could set up access and security to have different people allowed to do those different functions. And then when the alarm is suppressed, you can actually have them enter a, a reason, choose a reason as to why they're suppressing that alarm. So then you have that information recorded in your log. You can see you have different um, dedicated displays showing the alarms that are suppressed, and that's one of the benefits of using this. It's all contained in the Delta V system. You don't have to write it down on a log outside and hope to remember that somebody's going to re-enable re that alarm three months from now. It's all maintained live with updated statuses within the Delta V system and you can separate it out based on whether it's shelving or out of service. Another thing to, to put in your philosophy is alarm classification, which is a way to group alarms that have common sets of requirements for training or testing or management of change. Good examples might be for personnel safety, safety alarms, alarms that are used in your independent protection layer analysis, and your LOPA analysis, um, and if they're actually uh, there's a concept also called highly managed alarms, which is those type of alarms that require a lot of um, extra requirements, kind of like what you would do for a safety alarm. So part of what this says is not all alarms are created equal. Some require a lot more thought when you do stuff. So different from your general process alarm where you might allow an operator to change a limit, disable the alarm, engineers might go in and change stuff. If you're talking about a safety alarm like this one, you don't want anybody messing with that alarm because if it doesn't work and somebody walks in that analyzer shed when they shouldn't, they could die. So that's a really, really important alarm. That's a life safety alarm. So that's why it would be treated differently and thus assigned a classification to indicate that it has different requirements. Now classification comes up in Delta V because it's, it's native to Delta V. So every alarm can be assigned to a class classification. That shows up in alarm help. It shows up in the event chronicle. And then in version 13, you can actually use that to filter the alarm summary display. So if you create a classification for safety alarms or environmental alarms or LOPA alarms, you can create a summary display to show you just the alarms in that category, which helps you know, hopefully you don't have too many there. You can also use that as part of your auditing system to say, we want to be checking for our safety alarms. We want to check to make sure those set points or priorities or enable status are not being changed because they're the most important alarms in the whole system. After you're done the philosophy, that's when we jump into alarm rationalization, where you're reviewing the alarms to determine whether they meet the criteria in your philosophy. This is a process that you go through, you think about and document what the likely cause of the alarm is, what's the corrective action, what's the consequence. There's good information on how to do this in the new technical report that I mentioned. Technical report number two has a lot of good information on rationalization. Uh, Exida has a tool called Cell Alarm that works with Delta V that will guide you through this process, help you determine um, whether the alarm is valid and document your decision-making process. And here's some examples or screenshots of that. 
We have our prioritization matrix. We're ranking the consequences, evaluating the consequences, and, and coming up with the prior, what the priority of the alarm should be. Down here, we're looking at establishing the alarm limit. And different from when I used to do projects, we don't set alarm limits at 80% of engineering range and 90% of engineering range and let them ride like that. We say, well, what are we actually trying to prevent? There's a consequence we're trying to prevent by this alarm. When does that consequence occur? That's the consequence threshold. Let's set the alarm limit in relation to that, in relation to the event we're trying to prevent from happening. And if we know the rate of change in some of the other process dynamics, that helps us set an appropriate limit that gives the operator enough time to respond. Now, as part of the rationalization process, hopefully you're, you're taking some of your most experienced operators. They're helping you determine what's the cause, what's the consequence, corrective action. So this is also a knowledge capture process for your whole process facility. If you do this and you capture the information in the cell alarm tool, then we can push that into Delta V and populate the alarm help faceplate. Remember we said, that there's requirements for providing alarm response procedures to the operator that is fulfilled by Delta V alarm help. So if you do rationalization within the cell alarm tool, you can automatically take that information and use it to create your alarm response procedures. And then you can push that information via bulk edit into and out of Delta V, updating all of the alarm parameter information. Now I'm gonna turn it back over to Kim and he's gonna talk about the next phase alarm suppression. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the capabilities that exist in the Delta V system in this realm of advanced alarming, and one is in the area of alarm flood suppression. We have a definition of the alarm flood, which is uh, 10 alarms per 10 minutes or more. Uh, and what I'd like to bring to your attention in this particular slide is a uh, new capability that is available for version 12 and version 13 is called Delta V uh, Alarm Mosaic. Uh, in this particular tool, the alarms are presented not in the classic list form, but more of a pattern of alarms uh, where uh, as you move to the left, that represents how long that alarm has been uh, uh, on the uh, alarm list, but graphically presented. Uh, also using this particular tool, uh, you can, uh, each of these represents a time bucket. You can see uh, a little human kind of a silhouette with a number. These represent control actions that are being captured and presented to the operator so that they can see uh, the sequence of things that might have happened leading up to or for that matter uh, following the, uh, the alarm um, uh, event, the uh, flood here, what actions are being taken to, uh, to mitigate them. So this is very powerful. Another feature of this particular product here is that uh, later on after the alarm flood is over, perhaps during an investigation, forensics, uh, there is the ability to actually recall through an activation history past uh, alarm floods and just portray them using the same tool. Um, another advanced alarming concept is to use some uh, dynamic alarming if there are alarm floods that you can anticipate, uh, perhaps a first out kind of a thing where one alarm uh, goes off and other alarms need to be suppressed to not overwhelm the operator, or even a more powerful kind of a suppression where you want to detect something like a compressor trip, suppress all alarms and substitute just one alarm. You can do that with uh, uh, the modules that are available for Delta V. We have a flood suppression module and a first out module. Uh, these modules are available for a use in Delta V version 10, 11, 12, and 13. In the version 13.3.1 system, we're actually putting these modules right into the out-of-box Delta V module uh, library template. Uh, going back to the conversation about ongoing measurement of alarm performance, uh, the kinds of things that you are looking for in terms of uh, uh, opportunities to improve the performance of your system, as shown here on the left, are part of what you get with Delta V Analyze. As one example, uh, Delta V Analyze produces a list of the top 20 chattering and fleeting alarm sources. And uh, here what you see uh, highlighted are some horribly uh, chattering alarms. Uh, taking this one as an example here, we have a module here where the alarm enunciated over 50,000 times. Now, over 50,000 times, uh, the average time it was active was for five seconds. So uh, that gives you an item to go ahead and attack and some sil similar examples uh, below that. Uh, 
Delta V Analyze uh, can be configured. One of the most important things is to set it up where you're getting your reports based on operator positions, but other capabilities exist in Delta V Analyze to tune it to match uh, your requirements. Uh, in terms of the uh, alarm performance, uh, we've got the ability in uh, Delta V to uh, actually use these functional classifications which Todd made reference to and to use those classifications throughout all of, of Delta V. Here are just three examples. One can create a custom alarm list around a functional classification, local listed alarms. Uh, one can, when you're looking at alarms in this alarm mosaic product, actually break the alarms out by the classification, either to just multi-select or even to uh, filter on. And when you're obtaining your statistics, one of your choices for filtering capabilities is to uh, use functional classifications as well. Um, an optional addition to Delta V Analyze, uh, if you uh, wish to have it, would be a product that's called the Excel Reporter from SciTech. What this particular product does is take Delta V Analyze basic capability to generate these alarm statistic reports, but it can automate the aggregation of multiple statistics reports into a common database to then provide subsequent uh, additional reporting capabilities or distribution capabilities, things to publish to HTML, PDF. Uh, uh, also using Excel Reporter, this particular package allows you to take the information from Delta V Analyze and supplement it by connecting to uh, data that might exist in other uh, databases within Delta V, other historians. So a lot of rich capability there that many customers are uh, using in addition to Delta V Analyze. This brings me to the subject of auditing. Uh, when you're auditing your alarms, of course the goal there is to make sure that what's happening in the running system is consistent with what your engineering database uh, indicates the alarm setting should be and of course uh, with what the master alarm database requirements are. And so we have in uh, Delta V two audit reporting mechanisms. We have a Delta V audit report mechanism that makes online uh, scheduled or on-demand uh, comparisons between the configured alarm settings, things like limit and priority, and whether or not the enabled alarm is, uh, is currently shelved or not, or suppressed. And uh, so that is a capability that you could use to do day-to-day -day auditing or even shift-to-shift -shift auditing. It does this because it, it uh, runs natively within Delta V. It's very fast and works in the background. For uh, the comparisons that you might want to do, uh, say monthly, for example, between the master alarm database where there's ongoing rationalization activity and uh, the engineering database, there are auditing tools for that and those reside primarily in the SIL alarm product. So uh, this is taking a look at that comparison between the engineering database and the runtime. For this particular example, in Delta V, a report was created for something called significant alarms. And in this particular example, significant alarms were alarms that had functional classifications of local listed, safety, environmental protection. And so uh, using this report here, a difference can be generated that says, you know what, this particular alarm right here is enabled in the configuration. And in the runtime, yes, it's enabled there, but it's actually out of service. And this would be an unauthorized action potentially because no reason was specified. So if you're wanting to differentiate between uh, suppressions where there's a, a reason uh, declared versus those where there's not, this would be a good way to uh, manage that. Also, this particular alarm had a limit value configured of 95, but someone in the running system has bumped it up to 100. Here's another example of an alarm where it was configured to be a warning priority but in fact, it's actually running as a log priority, which is to say it's really not showing up for the operator at all. So that'd be a good example of using that native capability that exists in Delta V version 13 to run those kind of audit reports. Uh, within the SIL alarm product, there is likewise an ability to not only both deliver into the Delta V system the desired alarm settings, but also to both export out of Delta V and bring into SIL alarm the uh, as configured alarm settings to be uh, compared against what the master alarm database says with tools that would allow you to review, accept, or reject uh, the, uh, the, the changes that you see between the configured system and the uh, master alarm database. So a lot of good capability right there. It also allows you to create an enforce file that you could actually transfer back into the Delta V system to reestablish changes that were made in the engineering system. So I think that one, uh, back to you, Todd. Yep. So one of the takeaways I hope that you all have is that this is something that you can do. 
Here's an example of a customer that presented at last year's exchange, Ashland Chemicals, that's gone through this whole entire process. They're on the audit step, so they've made it through all seven steps. They started with about 7,000 alarms. When they went through rationalization, they got that down to about 2,100. Um, they changed the priority distribution. Alarms are such that operators respond to them much more um, aggressively now. They implemented alarm help, which the operators really like. They also started to implement alarm flood suppression. And apparently that seems to be going well because the operators are now coming to them with other scenarios where they say, can you suppress alarms when this piece of equipment goes down? We know we don't need the alarms. So they're attacking that one one step at a time. So now to kind of summarize, uh, what did we talk about? Creating an alarm, effective alarm management improvement program that can be applied at any plant uh, in any application where you initially benchmark and define your goals, what you want to improve. And we talked about creating a program that would actually allow you to create a continuous uh, sustainable improvement program, continuous improvement following the, the steps that we talked about that align with the alarm management life cycle. If you do that, that will help improve the operator's ability to do their job, prevent plant shutdowns, improve productivity, also improve process safety in your plant. This process will also allow you to document your performance improvement over time so that as you're justifying the, the project and the, the resource utilization, you can show management what you've accomplished, what you've made better. And then last but not least, hopefully once you've had the alarm system cleaned up, you can actually use it to drive process improvement, make things better, help the operator do their job better. So on that note, I'll turn it over to any questions. I know we're just about out of time, but we probably have time for, for one or two questions. Uh, that's a good question. So the question was for the Ashland example that I mentioned, what was the time frame from beginning to end? I think it's been about two years, a year and a half from, from the creation of the alarm philosophy to rationalization to, you know, obviously like most plants, people aren't sitting around with nothing to do saying, hey, uh, oh, alarm rationalization, I'd love to have something to do. I'm kind of bored right now. Um, so they were able to, to create a program where they, where they fit that in. Um, I think it took them, in duration, six months, but not six months of effort, six months of time period to get the rationalization done, then the implementation, and now they're going back doing the alarm flood suppression, you know, one scenario at a time and doing the auditing. So, good question. Yes? Okay, so the question was the, the tools that we've talked about, which ones are out of the box, which ones are additional add-ons? For the Delta V side, I'll, I'll speak to that. Uh, the um, three features that you've seen here that are uh, require an extra license, if you will, would be Delta V Analyze, and there's just one license per system. It's not based on the size of the system. Um, the uh, second one is Alarm Help, Alarm Help is a workstation license, and we have uh, the ability to order just one uh, license for one workstation or a group of five or a group of ten. Uh, the third item that was a feature that requires a separate license from the Delta V is Alarm Mosaic, and that can be uh, purchased. It's a workstation app, uh, as opposed to a server app. It runs on workstations. Uh, so it was also, like, like Alarm Help, offered uh, for one workstation, or you can buy five or 10. There's also, uh, in version 13, a license that you can purchase for uh, system-wide, just turn it on everywhere, and that would be uh, turning on Alarm Help and Alarm Mosaic, which is the single system-wide license. Um, in terms of Alarm Help and Alarm Mosaic, on the Professional Plus, you can actually access those without a license. If you have 
version 12 or version 13 to try them out and see uh, how they might work for you in your scenario. Uh, by contrast, the things that you do not have to pay extra for in version things are like the auditing capability, the dynamic alarming modules that were referenced uh, can be obtained, uh, they're out of the box in 13.3.1, but could be obtained for version 10, 11, 12 uh, systems. Uh, the shelving and out of service and functional classification features, those are all just native parts of Delta V as well. And then SIL alarm is actually a tool from Exeter that's, that's separate as well. Another question. The question has to do with what degree of customization exists with Delta V Analyze. Uh, there is a, a limited amount of ability to really tailor the content. You can tune it, and I did have one slide that showed what you can do with Delta V Analyze. Uh, Delta V Analyze does provide a significant number, I think it's like six or so uh, bad actor lists. So uh, the specific example that I think you cited was, is could you get a list of the alarms that were Suppressed? suppressed, yes, that's one of them. You can get a, a list of the alarms that were suppressed. You can get a list of alarms that were uh, actually disabled. You can get a list of the alarms that operators are most frequently, are taking the longest time to acknowledge, maybe indicating that they just started to ignore them. There are lists of uh, the alarms that occur most frequently, the alarms that are, uh, have the shortest duration times, the chattering fleeting alarms, and a list of the alarms that have the longest activation times, the stale alarms. So those are the out-of-box uh, alarms, or the you know uh, uh, lists that exist in that report. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. You mentioned that the compliance could change. There was a complication in how to handle the alert, alert from the net. Is that something you can make available? Yes, we can do that. Yep, we can add that as, as something that goes with this, okay. this presentation. Yes, uh, you know, clarify, we, uh, in last year's exchange, uh, had a presentation where we uh, showed, I think, seven or eight different uh, lightly configured kind of uh, ready-for-use solutions that would apply to alarm management. We took some standard new functionality from version 13 and, and some older functionality and just put up some examples in um, Things you could do things you could within do. the alarm system. Uh, yeah, tailor it to your functionality. So. I think that the uh, previous Emerson Exchange presentations may already be available on Emerson uh, exchange, exchange. Yeah, but we'll, we'll call it out so that it's we'll easy be sure. to find. So, okay. On that note, we'll end. Thank you very much, everybody.